On this edition of The Best Times, you'll meet two couples who have lived a life outdoors, working to protect and preserve the parks and wilderness areas of our region. And you'll find out why more and more people are dancing their way to health and fitness. Funding for the Best Times is provided by... Since 1988, the H.W. Durham Foundation has been focused on aging issues, providing grants to programs like the Best Times to enrich and improve the quality of life for our older citizens. The Best Times is the only monthly news magazine exclusively for the age 50 plus reader. Your copy is free at over 200 locations with important stories and news you don't want to miss. The Best Times is always the best. Trezevant, a life care community, a celebration of life. The responsible decision for your well-being now and in the long term. And being responsible has never been such a hoot. TrezevantManor.org Aristotle wrote that in all things of nature, there is something of the marvelous. The great naturalist John Muir referred to our parks and wilderness areas as fountains of life. To be sure, the picture postcard views of Yosemite or the Great Smoky Mountains are awe-inspiring. But what about our parks and wild spaces that are much closer to home? Who's protecting those areas and what does the future hold? Let me introduce you to two couples who have dedicated themselves to preserving and protecting our natural environment and who have lived a life outdoors. Visit downtown in the late afternoon or on the weekend, and you might see Joe and Carol Lee Royer pedaling back home after a 20-mile ride along the Mississippi River Trail. And that's as it should be. After all, it's how they met. A cycling. We bumped into each other on, on bicycles. And, uh, just riding the beautiful roads of uh, Memphis and Shelby County, and that's, that's where we met, and we've We've been lucky to travel quite a bit and ride in Europe and around the U.S. and uh, our, our favorite roads are right here in Shelby County. And if you can't find them cycling, then look down the bluff along the river and you might catch a glimpse of them paddling a kayak in the late afternoon sun. They've lived their lives outdoors, traveling the world to taste its beauty and adventure. But they've always come home to Memphis. The more that we went away, whether it be in the Northeast in New England or out in the West, California or the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, Montana. Uh, the more we went away the, and we came back and we rode our bikes in Shelby Farms or we paddled our kayak in the Mississippi or we just took a walk along the riverfront, the more we have appreciated Memphis and the more we have focused on our effort of preserving our town. Our strong belief is that the park closest to your home is the most important park in the world. Joe and Carol Lee come by their love of the Memphis environs honestly and through their own hard work. Carol Lee is a financial planner who was once a competition cyclist. Joe has a degree in engineering, but his passion for outdoor activities made him chuck the engineering career for that of co-owner of Outdoors Incorporated. I think our biggest talent is, was not to underestimate Memphians. Uh, we provided the best hiking boots, the best backpacks, the best bicycles, the best kayaks. I think that, that observation that don't underestimate Memphians uh, in what they, and that, that's allowed us, to, I think, to stay in business for uh, over 30 years now. Outdoors Incorporated is the sponsor for the annual Canoe and Kayak Race, one of the biggest such events in the country. 
And this November will mark the 23rd year for the Cyclocross Championships, held on Greenbelt Park on Mud Island. Joe and Carol Lee believe that there is a link between using and protecting our environment and attracting the best businesses and workers to Memphis. I go to outdoor conferences three or four times a year, and the trend in the, in the outdoor world is, is having these cities that offer cycling and offer canoeing and offer hiking in their metro areas. New York has transformed itself completely in the past couple of decades. Amsterdam has done this same thing. They've cleaned up their canals and Paris, a congested city like Paris, is putting in bike lanes. Quality of life is really important to, to your business climate. The Royers feel that quality of life is also an issue for local residents who can't take the two-week vacation to go to a national park. If you're not close to a national park, it's hard to go for the week vacation or the two-week vacation. Most of us are kind of getting a little bit a long weekend, maybe taking a, the Monday holiday and getting three days. And so that's why we have focused so much on our local Shelby Farms, Overton Park, Audubon Park, the Wolf River, and the mighty Mississippi. Water's been magical to me, and I, I love the Mississippi. Uh, this morning when we took off at sunrise, the, we heading up the bank, we saw three fox and then we saw, uh, we crossed the river and we saw three deer on the uh, Lusahatchee Bar, a little island right across from Harbor Town. And it's just, uh, the, the Mississippi is one of the most phenomenal resources in the world. And it's, it's really being, uh, the city's sort of turning towards the river right now again. We, it was, it's the reason we are a city here mm -hmm. because of this. And we're sitting on the fourth of the, uh, over the Chickasaw Bluffs over Tom Lee Park here. And it, it's just a magical place in the world. Joe is on the board of directors of the Mississippi River Trail. Just like the Appalachian Trail, which meanders through 14 states from Maine to Georgia, the Mississippi River Trail follows the river, linking cities and towns along 3,000 miles of bike trails. Memphis is a wonderful town and area to bicycle in. It's relatively flat. And when you're outside riding a bike, it's just just so, uh, so much more interesting. Well, there's so many unique places that you can see. You can just access so much more than you can and notice the, the smells and the sounds and the beauty than, than you can when you're in a car. The ultimate lesson that Joe and Carol Lee have learned from their life outdoors is that the places that John Muir call the fountains of life are the places that lift the human spirit. I, I really think that uh, treaty, the public lands are, are, should be kept pristine. They should be open to the public to use, but, uh, and, and I, I think that our national park, Yellowstone, what always comes to mind, Yosemite, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, the wonderful Great Smokies, they just, uh, they, they're just peaceful when you drive in and the billboards are gone and the lights, the LEDs are gone and, and you see these magnificent green spaces that are protected and, and they're for the public. Everyone is equal in that. Everybody, we're, we're offering this to every person uh, in our country and the world to come and have this experience. And to me, how you protect your public space it's kind of how you're judged as a culture. We dated in a canoe, for sure. <laughs> yeah. You took her on a date in a canoe? Oh, yeah. I actually worked for her father, so I was dating the boss's daughter, which is not the smartest thing to do. Um, <laughs> but I, it actually started out not as a date. I needed a field partner to go out in the field and go out in the swamps. And I think somebody said they wanted to go. And so Larry Smith and Naomi Van Toll have shared a canoe house, and a love for the canoe. environment for their 12 years of marriage. In the mud. Naomi is a stay-at-home mom who serves on the board of Citizens to Preserve Overton Park. 
It was our first city park. It was founded in 1901, um, and it really started all of the whole park system in Memphis. That was the beginning. Um, so the fact that people preserved that forest, you know, starting so early on, it's really inspiring to, to us and, you know, to me personally. And I think it really shows how just a few people can make such a big difference. Um, so people think, well, surely now the park is saved and it won't ever be impacted. But there's really no legal protection for Overton Park other than what the city of Memphis chooses to, you know, give it. So, you know, my citizens group is is working to establish some type of real protection that's lasting so that our future generations can use the park the same way that, that we do to preserve it. Twice a month, Naomi gives guided tours of the old forest in Overton Park, where hikers can experience this land as it was 10,000 years ago, after the last ice age. For Naomi, it is a journey of rediscovery. We need places to rest our spirit, we need places to restore our souls, is what you know a lot of these early people um, felt you know that you you can get something by going out into the wilderness that you can't get anywhere else and you have a connection with um, the natural world and with the past and you know it's just this amazing feeling that's so different from you know our modern lives where we're you know in cars and in offices and you know we're surrounded by asphalt and glass and we just we lose that sense of ourselves as part of the world and so I think that when you're out in nature and you realize how small and insignificant you are, you know, I think it helps us to be better humans. Larry has a law degree and works as a supervisor in the air quality improvement branch of the health department. He's been active in many environmental organizations over the years, but he's felt a particular kinship with the Wolf River. Uh, just from the time I was about seven or eight, uh, I was drawn to the forest, uh, grew up riding my bike down to the Wolf River uh, back in the late 60s when it was still the penal farm. And I don't know, I just the first time I entered the forest and uh, I just knew that's where I wanted to be. Larry has served on the board of the Wolf River Conservancy and was its first paid employee. A bunch of like-minded folks uh, just saw an amenity in the Wolf River both from its uh, urban sections to the wilder sections and saw a chance to preserve something and so uh, and it just fit the person I was or thought I was or knew I was it just I thought well, here's a group that if I could have thought about it I would have started and so it's a it was a wonderful effort to be part of that. Last month he took a nationwide group from the Corps of Engineers on a tour of the Wolf River Wetlands Restoration Project an effort to mitigate the channelization of the river and reclaim the wetlands. The project was, that was there on the Wolf was an effort to stop that process and basically a reversal of philosophy that the wetlands do have a purpose, wetlands are valuable, so let's do something to try and save them. It's not just an aesthetic argument that you would make for, say, the Wolf River project. You wouldn't, it says, well, the wetlands are pretty, so we should preserve them. For Memphis in particular, that part of the river is an integral part of our aquifer system. You know, as you'll recall, we get no drinking water from the Mississippi River whatsoever. We get all of our drinking water from about a thousand feet under this picnic table right here. Now, that layer that's a thousand feet under our seat here is at the surface, right at, at the surface of the earth around where that uh, project is and further up. So the water is interchanging continually with that geologic layer and filtering down into to where it's a thousand feet under here in Memphis. So protecting uh, its exposure is a very uh, straightforward reason for economically, health-wise, and everything. We want to protect our drinking water source. Larry and Naomi are dedicated to environmental causes, so much so that they're not afraid to put their money where their mouth is. In Mississippi, the Wolf River Conservancy didn't have a government agency to work with. And so, you know, Larry just felt very strongly that we had to buy some land. <laughs> so we did. So we did. So we own 200 acres in North Mississippi. We in the bank. We in the bank. Um, because we felt like it, we needed to make a personal commitment to that. But hopefully someday that might be added into a park or you know, have it be something that the public could use. The United States has well over 10,000 parks and protected areas set aside by federal, state, and local governments. Our national parks alone amount to more than 1 million square miles of land. That's 27% of the total landmass in America. Why have we chosen to protect so much land for public use? Larry and Naomi have an answer. I just feel so strongly attracted to, you know, this 
the natural world and you know I love forests and I love swamps and I hate to see them destroyed. Um, so it's important to preserve some of those places and you know we can't preserve them all um, but we can preserve some of them um, and at least enough so that our future generations can see you know what we had. It would just be a real shame to to lose those resources. Looking back over the accomplishments that, that I have done and the accomplishments that Naomi has, has, has done, I'm not, I can't speak for her, but for myself, I, I take a great deal of pride that, to feel, in the feeling that when I leave the planet, there'll be something preserved or in a park, if you will, that's there for others that I'll never know, never know these human beings, and they're gonna be there and enjoy it, and they might sit and wonder, who did this? Why did they do it? A life without these places, it, it be, it's just like life without art or music. Life without air to life, breathe. Life without air, yes. it, it's it connected with where I, we belong. Hiking on trails or cycling on city streets is one way of exercising and staying healthy. But some people have just got to dance. In fact, 30 minutes of continuous dancing will burn between 200 and 400 calories. That's as much as walking, swimming, or cycling. So get up off your feet. You should be dancing. Remember Friday night sock hops? Well, they're still alive and well at the weekly dances held by the Memphis Bop Club. Founded in 1987, it's one of two organizations in Memphis that takes its members on a regular trip down memory lane. Boppin' Tommy Polson is a co-founder of the club and a regular DJ for the Friday night dances. Foundation is rhythm and blues. That's what the kids in Memphis grew up with many, many years ago. We've been playing a lot of the old R&B that Dewey Phillips played on the radio for these kids when they were growing up to listen to. They danced back then and they're still dancing to it today. One of those kids that's still dancing is Bunny Lee Wilhelm, also a co-founder of the club. And interestingly, back in the 60s, she was the first go-go dancer in Memphis. And because I learned to bop in the 50s and it was so meaningful. It's, and when you play the blues, and you bop and you feel it, there's no greater high. <laughs> I can remember when I was in junior high school, I hadn't learned to dance. I didn't know how to dance, but I was always over by the records, putting the records on the turntable. So I, and I never thought of it back then. It didn't make any sense to me. Now it makes sense to me looking back at, you know, what was this passion? What is this crazy passion? Club members range in age from the 50s to the mid 70s. And if you don't know how to dance or need a little refresher, Wayne Maxey and Barbara Cooley are ready to teach you. And we teach not only the bop, but other styles of dance. Uh, West Coast, East Coast Swing, uh, Blind Dance, uh, Cha Cha. Exercise, the love of music, companionship. Uh, it's become a social environment for our kinds of people who enjoy this kind of music and this kind of dance, the bop. We may be old, but we ain't dead. We get out on the dance floor, we enjoy dancing, and that's what the, the people that migrate to this club, that's what they enjoy doing. It's just really a high energy group and gives you the other end of the spectrum of what you can do at a senior citizen. I'm 74, so I'm just getting started, baby. <laughs> Square dancing has its roots in 17th century Europe, but the colonists who settled this country quickly established it as a uniquely American dance form. Robert Townsend is a square dance caller. 
With over a hundred variations of calls, Robert likens his task to solving a human Rubik's Cube. They, they are the part of the Rubik's Cube, and I get to move them around, mess them up, and then I have to figure out how to get them back out a lot of times. It takes about 20 to 25 lessons to learn the 68 basic square dance steps. It's both physically and mentally demanding, and that's good for your brain. A New England Journal of Medicine study concluded that dancing at least twice a week can make people less likely to develop dementia. So you have to be thinking every minute, because he's calling the calls minute by minute. You know, it's not a script. You don't know what's coming next. A typical evening of square dancing, which is about two hours, the average person will probably do anywhere from three to five miles worth of walking or movement during that time. It's tiring, and yes, you do hurt, but it, you just feel energized when you're doing it. But you don't realize how much you know, energy you've burned and how many calories you've used up and you're just having a good time because for two hours your mind's away from everything. Marianne Walker is president of the Greater Memphis Square and Round Dance Association, which represents about 15 clubs in the Memphis area. They dance five nights a week. And as Marianne points out, singles are welcome. Yes, you don't have to have a partner. We can supply that and many women, well not many, but several women do dance the boys part. Marianne and Robert are quick to shoot down a common misconception about square dancing. No, everybody thinks it's country and everybody teases me because I don't like country. And they'll go, but you square dance. And I'll say, but we don't square dance to country music. The uh, music we use now varies anyway from today's generation music uh, to country western music, just all different types of music we use. Different types of music with over a hundred different calls make square dancing challenging but it's the people that make it fun. It's friendship set to music. When I walk into a square dance hall, I walk into smiling faces, I walk into people, if they've had a bad day, you'd never know it, because we have one common thing, and that's just the fun and the fellowship of square dancing. Fun, for one thing. Fun, fun, social activity, yeah. uh, clean, you know, healthy, uh, brain activity, yeah. muscle activity, it's, it's everything, it's perfect, better than aerobics. Dancing is exercise, but exercise can also be dancing. And the latest exercise craze is Zumba. Zumba is a fitness workout program based on Latin steps that are easy to follow. Elisa Townsend teaches Zumba Gold, a specialized offshoot of regular Zumba that focuses on older adults. The word Zumba originates from an African dialect, and it means to move swiftly with grace. At the core of Zumba is the music. Samba, mambo, cha-cha, salsa, merengue, all sorts of flamenco, belly dance, and not only Latin, but also hip hop and uh, reggaeton, all of that with a Zumba flavor. Made it to a way that you can have fun and burn calories in an optimized way that we call interval training. If you vary the intensity, your body will most likely improve and optimize the caloric output and you're going to be burning more calories. We definitely get a good workout and Alisa trims it. That's why we appreciate her so much because she tells you at the start of the class, if this is too strenuous for you, you know, you can tone down and do this step. You know, you don't have to keep up with the fast pace if you're not able to, but each week she encourages us to do a little bit more. So it's definitely a good workout. I've done exercise all my life, but this is the most fun thing I've ever done in exercise. You're working out, but you don't realize you're working out. Fun is a key motivator for Zumba participants, along with what Elisa calls your Zumba family. Uh, it improves them not only in terms of physical fitness, but also in terms of self-acceptance, self-confidence, self-esteem. It brings cultures and people together in an environment that is very inclusive. There, they make a lot of friendships. They feel a support group. They feel like a family. So I encourage anybody that wants to get moving, this is a good place to, it's a good thing to do. Want more information about life after 50? 
go to our website, wkno.org slash best times. And while you're online, click over to Next Avenue, PBS's website, where grown-ups keep growing. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Hardaway. Good night. Funding for the best times is provided by Trezevant, a life care community, a celebration of life. The responsible decision for your well-being now and in the long term. And being responsible has never been such a hoot. TrezevantManor.org The Best Times is the only monthly news magazine exclusively for the age 50 plus reader. Your copy is free at over 200 locations with important stories and news you don't want to miss. The Best Times is always the best. Since 1988, the H.W. Durham Foundation has been focused on aging issues, providing grants to programs like The Best Times to enrich and improve the quality of life for our older citizens.